I'm gonna sing, sing, sing. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm gonna sit at Jesus' side. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout. Praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm gonna sit at Jesus' side. I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna shout, praise the Lord. Roll the gospel chariot along. Roll the gospel chariot along. Roll the gospel chariot along. And we won't tag along behind. If our brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If our brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. If our brother's in the way, we will stop and pick him up. And we won't tag along behind. If our sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If our sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. If our sister's in the way, we will stop and pick her up. And we won't tag along behind. But if the devil's in the way, we will run right over him. If the devil's in the way, we will run right over him. If the devil's in the way, we will run right over him. And we won't tag along behind. Hey, hey. Well, good morning, everybody. I've got kids scattered all over this morning, so good to see everyone again. Yeah? Glad to be back. Glad to see a lot of you back. I know we've had a lot traveling the last couple of weeks. We still have people traveling this week, so there's probably still people joining us online and all that other stuff. But for this morning, we're going to be talking about more messages from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, okay? So right there at the beginning of the New Testament. And Jesus has been talking to the people that were there listening and to us today who read it about how there were things that some people said, well, you can do it this way and that's good enough. But Jesus would say, but I'm telling you, I want a little bit more from my disciples. My disciples, my disciples will want to go the extra mile. They won't want to try to get out of the good things by trying to cheat people or by trying to trick people. And so one of the things he started talking about was when you give people your word or when you promise something, you're really going to mean it, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, there were ways that kids would talk to each other and they'd do things that tried to get them out of whatever they promised to do, all right? They'd say the words, but they really didn't mean it. That doesn't happen for you guys nowadays, does it? Oh, it does. Yeah, of course. This is a problem that is as old as time. And I always love this movie. You, you recognize this movie? Yeah? Yeah? Good old Willy Wonka. And he's there, and he's got the group of kids in front of him, and he goes, I have the greatest piece of candy that's ever been invented. And he's telling them all about it and how you can suck on it and suck on it and try to chew it or whatever, but it's never going to run out. It's an everlasting gobstopper and he promises it I know that I, I've got some of the adults in the room are going I love this movie and I see I see the grins and I love it so you're right here with us right so they probably know what's coming if y'all don't I'll tell you here in just a second but he's got it out he's got the group of kids in front of him that are getting the tour of the factory and he says this I can only give it if you solemnly swear to keep it for yourself so this is for you. This is a special gift just for you. You don't get to share it. You don't get to give it to anybody else. You don't tell anybody else about it. This is for you. Can you promise? And if you can promise, you can keep it. And of course, all the kids say, yeah, absolutely. But, fingers behind your back. If you have your fingers crossed, nothing you say counts, right? That's the way you get, you know, oh yeah, mom and dad, I promise to clean my room. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, friend, yeah, I'll give you a piece of candy if I get a piece of candy. Ha, 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 ha. I had my fingers crossed. It doesn't count. Is that how it works? Is that how it should work? Maybe is the better question. No. When we say something, our words should mean exactly what they mean. 
Yeah? If we promise something, we should keep our promises. If we tell someone that I won't do that or I'll have your back or I'm going to be right there with you or I'm going to get it done at a certain time, we should always be truthful and honest in what we say. Yeah? But it's not just kids that try to trick people like that, is it? And when Jesus was talking to whoever was in that audience, he knew that they may not have their fingers behind their back, but in different ways, they knew just how to say, oh, I promise this, but they really didn't mean it. And so that's what we're going to look at in our lesson today. So I hope that each of us, whatever age we may be, are honest in the things that we say. Okay? We don't want to try to get out of it by crossing our fingers. That won't lead to people thinking very highly of us, will it? We won't be trustworthy and honest, which is what we want. All right? So I'm glad you all are here. Y'all can head back, sit with various family and friends that you may be here with this morning. If everyone who is here, if you'll take a moment and grab one of those cards in the back of the pew, if you could fill that out, there's one side for our guests and our visitors, there's one side for our members. You can fill that out, pass it to the center aisles, and we'll have a couple of young men coming to pick those up a little bit later in worship service. And each and every week, we're gathering for our food pantry. This week, we're gathering canned meats, okay? So the spams, the tunas, the chickens, all those sort of different things, if you could bring a variety of those items and fill our pantry with those, that'll really help us as we continue trying to serve that need within our community. But at this time, let's stand and let's continue to sing together this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God, praise God. Praise Within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweet as name I on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I
Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy. sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. There is an Echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep? from singing your praise. How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will morning church. The psalm reading today is Psalm 26. Um, this is a psalm of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. 
I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Please bow with me. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all together this morning safely so that we may come together and worship you. Please watch over this church family and the many brothers and sisters that we have around the world. I ask that you prepare our hearts and minds for the message you brought us today and help us to spread it into the world this week. Help us to cling to you always and help us to be walking testimonies of your love and forgiveness. In your son's name I pray, amen. This will be our song before we take of communion together this morning. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Good morning, church. As we prepare our hearts and mind for the Lord's Supper, I'm reminded uh, as a parent the love and affection that you have for your children. And as a longtime parent, all the trials and tribulations, and when they would be in pain or they would be sad or emotional and you just wanted to make it right, you just wanted to fix it immediately. I mean, they're a piece of you as a parent. They always will be. You tie that back to our Father in heaven who intentionally sent his only son to die on the cross because he loved us so much. Watching his only son being crucified, whipped with metal, flesh torn from his body, nails through his hands and his feet, and having to just sit by and watch because he knew, and Jesus knew, it was the only way to save someone, especially like myself. Broken, flawed, a work in process. In Luke 23, verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed, breath, breathed his last breath. Will you bow with me? Heavenly gracious Father, we fall to our knees, we lift our hands, and we give you thanks 
for your beautiful, wonderful son, Jesus, who knowingly sacrificed the most brutal death because he knew we could not make it to eternal heaven without that sacrifice. We remember his broken body on the cross and remember the sacrifice that you made sending your only son to die for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you bow with me for the fruit of the vine? Heavenly gracious Father, we lift our hands to you and give you thanks for the sacrifice of your son's blood on the cross. Father, we just block out the whole world and everything around us right now and we just focus on you. We lift up all of our brokenness, our sin, our fear, our loss, our illness, and we just lift it up to you, Father, and we ask that that blood washes us clean. Father, we're so thankful for our friends, our family, and this fellowship today. Please be with our kids, our grandkids, whether they're sitting right next to us or hours away. Place your heavenly hands upon them. We pray this prayer in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. At this time, if you've got your cards filled out, you can pass them to the center aisle. And a few people will come pick those up. And if you have any children that would like to join us in children's worship today, and if you're a guest wondering where that is, you head straight back out of the auditorium. You go upstairs into the center classroom, and that's where they will be during the sermon this morning. All right. While all of that is happening, let's all stand. And we're going to sing one more song before our scripture reading and lesson this morning. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Surround us, Lord. Surround us, O Lord. We need to be in your presence. So As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. So Surround us, 
Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 5, chapters 33 through 37. Again, you have heard that it, is, it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is, the, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simple, yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. You want to go to heaven? Well, six of you do. That's good. To start. I do. Do you want to go to heaven? Good. Now half of you do. You know, I was thinking, there's always in a preacher's mind, how can you start a lesson to grab the attention? They say first impression is everything. Yesterday morning, several of us met out at the riverfront for Walk for Water. And we had the fortunate idea or the, the way to get there early to help out set up. And as we get there, the fog was lifting off the river. And the sun was kind of coming up and there was a glow. And I couldn't help in that beautiful moment to think to myself how much I want to go to heaven one day. Every time I see nature in all of its beauty, that's where my mind goes is how awesome heaven's going to be. I don't know when I read the passages of Scripture that kind of try to explain to me what heaven's going to look like. I can sometimes have a hard time understanding really what it's going to look like. But in my mind, I know it's going to be awesome, and I know it's going to be beautiful. So when I see nature and its beauty, I think of heaven. And that fog lifting off the river yesterday morning reminded me of heaven, and it reminded me of us in our study on Sunday morning. Please understand, as we work through this text in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ's motivation through the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount was to get his disciples to heaven. Look at our main text that we've been looking back at every week. He says in verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. For unless your righteousness is greater than the so-called religious leaders of this time, the ones that walk around and they look the part and they speak the words that, that we may want to hear, he says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness, unless your rightness before God is greater than that, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, then he proceeds working through the text, telling us what that righteousness that exceeds looks like. That righteousness that exceeds says, don't merely kill somebody, but don't even perform the hate in your heart. That righteousness that exceeds says, do not commit adultery, but do not even lust in your heart. That righteousness that exceeds understands the grave dangers of divorce. Which brings us to our text this morning. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. 
Don't look for the loopholes in the text as, as he says, for you have heard of those of old that you shall not swear by anything in heaven and on earth. For what was happening was this. When you look at the text and the idea of what was happening in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 12, we have the commandment. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. In Numbers 30 and verse 2, and, and remember that at the time of the people, these people would understand these verses. It says in Numbers 30, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or he swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So this is what was happening. They were going along their life and they would try to add weight to the promises that they were making. And they would say things like this. I swear by the gold in the temple that I will perform this task. I swear uh, by all the elements that are sacred in the holy temple that I will perform this task. And it all comes down to the reasoning of why. Why were they having to do that? Why were they having to add weight to the promises they were making? What happened to the value of man's word? What happened to when I say yes, I mean yes, and when I say no, I mean no? What happened to that? I was watching Little House on the Prairie this last week. I don't know what's happening. I turned 40, uh, my health has gone down, and now I'm watching old people shows. I'll let you calm down for a minute. I'm joking. I love that show. But he walked into the store and with his word, without any money, was able to buy something knowing they were going to repay it. What happened to a man's word? What happened to us being able to say yes and following through with that word? I found a couple of interesting excerpts from either Reader's Digest or other funny things. He says, some of the most famous American fibs. We like to call them fibs because lies seem too hard, right? So we'll call them fibs. The most Ameri famous American fibs. The check is in the mail. Another famous American fib. I'll start my diet tomorrow. We service what we sell. Give me your number and the doctor will call you right back. One size fits all. This offer is limited to the first 100 people who call in. Your luggage isn't lost. It's only misplaced. Leave us your resume and I'll keep it on file. And maybe some of you heard this. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Oh yeah? I just need five minutes of your time. Open wide. It won't hurt a bit. Aaron, let's have lunch sometime. It's not the money, it's the principle. And we look at all those things and we laugh about them and I'm throwing them around very loosely, but is that not the culture we live in? The culture we live in has made it okay to say the fish was this big. The culture we live in has, has allowed us to not be completely honest in the words we use. A store manager heard his clerk tell a customer, No, ma'am, we haven't had any for a while, and it doesn't look as if we'll be getting any anytime soon. Horrified. The manager comes running over to the customer and said, Of course we'll have some soon. We placed an order last week. Later on, the manager drew the clerk aside and said, Never! Never say we're out of anything. Always say we have it on order and it's coming. What was it that she wanted? The clerk leaned over and said, rain. We have made it a laughing stock of the lies we tell. In fact, we call them white lies if they don't really intend to harm anybody. Well, it was just a fib. It was just something that was said that... It didn't really matter. Thus, we have to add weight to the words we say when we mean it. We say things like, I promise. Trust me. I swear. Honest to God. 
on my mother's grave. And we could go on and on and on with the things we've heard. We could even express it and say, well, you know me. We grew up together. You could trust me. Why are we having to add weight to the words we say? Because culturally, people have become less and less honest. People do not stick to their word like they used to say. Well, I will be there and we're, well, we'll see. Or we say things like, I'll believe it when I see it. Can you be a person of integrity and also have the heart of Christ? Can you not be a person of integrity and also have the heart of Christ? When you look at this text in Matthew chapter 5, our righteousness cannot exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees if our, if our integrity is not what it should be. Is anybody going to believe what we say, whether serious or non-serious? If every time we say something, we have to preface it or add weight to it with saying, I promise I'll really do it this time. Thus, the difficulty that they were in, in Christ's time. Adding these oaths, adding these weights to these proverbial, like Jed was talking about, crossing of fingers. Because you see, their way out was, if they didn't perform the oath in which they made... Their way out, according to different uh, historical documents, would say things like this. Well, I didn't swear by God's name. It was only the gold in the temple. I I didn't swear by God. I only swore by Jerusalem. I I didn't swear by God. I only swore by my head. Therefore, it's not really that important. It really didn't hold that much weight. Therefore, Christ says, do not swear an oath by anything. For if you are not intending to keep it, don't say it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. We continue down in this idea, and I think it's understandable that we find ourselves maybe in this text going, sometimes it's easier said than done. Why? Why sometimes is it easier for us to say we need to keep our word and to keep our mouth straight, be honest in our words, and maybe sometimes then we actually are. What pressures us to tell a distruth or lie? When you think of lies and what the motivation behind them are, it maybe leads us down a path of selfishness. Well, I didn't want to tell the truth because I was afraid I was going to get in trouble. I remember as a child using that excuse many times. I don't want to tell you the truth because I knew if I told you the truth I would be in more trouble. And I remember my parents saying something like this. Well now you're even in more trouble than you would have been in the first place. An officer comes and stops you and pulls you over and says, Do you know why I'm pulling you over? And you know well why he's pulling you over. You're more likely to get out of the ticket if you just say, Yeah, I was speeding, I wasn't paying attention, I messed up than trying to lie to get out of it. The selfishness that drives the lies, listen to me, is the same selfishness that drove the hatred in the heart of those who murdered. It's the same selfishness that drove the lust of the adulterer. And it's the same selfishness of the divorced or the divorcee. Because our selfishness cannot supersede the righteousness of Christ. We have to understand in our life that our hearts must be his and his and belong to him. It is not about me and we are told in various passages that we must die to self. For I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's a righteousness that exceeds. So he says, you have heard it was said. You have heard it was said by those of old. You can say these oaths and make these false promises as long as you don't swear by God. Once again, this topic of discussion keeps coming up of people going, well, this person over here told me it's okay. Let me ask you a question. Do you live your life that way? Do you live your life saying, I can do this because this group over here told me it's okay, I can do it. 
Well, this group over here said it was okay, and that's what everybody else is doing, right? We hear that, that argument. Everybody else is doing it, therefore, might is right. Sometimes, unfortunately, we live our lives that way, and we set rules by that. We set rules by saying, well, my parents said it was okay. Listen to me. If your parents said it was okay, and the scripture says it's wrong, it's wrong. If I tell you something is okay, but the scripture says it's wrong, it's wrong. If culture says something is okay, but the scripture says it's wrong, it's wrong. There's no way around that. But much like the scribes and the Pharisees, they looked for the loopholes in, in, in the old sayings to allow them to get out of things that God commanded them not to get out of. They looked for ways that they could maneuver around the commandments, maneuver around God's word. And if we are in that position in our life where we are constantly looking for ways to maneuver around God's word, the first place we must look is our heart. The first place we have to look if we're trying to maneuver around or find the loopholes in God's word is our heart. And we must ask ourselves the question, why? Why are we looking at the loopholes or looking for the loopholes to maneuver ourselves around God's word? Is it not good enough for us? He says, for all scripture is God breathed. If we are looking for loopholes to maneuver ourselves around God's word, we do not believe in the power of God's word. He, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation. We are cheapening that when we look for loopholes in God's word, that's what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing. When we have all these different denominations in this world saying, I'm throwing caution to the wind when it comes to God's word, they're saying God's word is not what God says it is. I don't want to be accused of that, do you? But the scribes and the Pharisees constantly look for those loopholes. They look for it in murder, in anger, in lust, in divorce, and they're doing it in their lies and in their oaths. I said, I think I can get around this. I think I can give you what you asked for. I think I can not pay you what I told you I was going to pay you. Because I didn't swear by God, I just swore by the gold in the temple. And that's really not that big of a deal. Christ says everything that you either swearing by, even though you're not saying God's name, is God's. And it belongs to him, even your head. For he knows and he can make one hair gray. For everything belongs to him. So in turn, when you are swearing by the gold in the temple, and in turn you are swearing by Jerusalem, or you are swearing by your head, you are swearing by God, for let your yes be yes and your no be no, he says. For you have heard it was said that way, but Christ says, I say to you. When a preacher gets up and talk, when I get up and talk and I give you the illustration, you can listen to me or not, but when I start reading from God's word, listen closely. Because that's what's happening here in Matthew chapter 5. Christ is saying, you have heard it was said, and you listen to these things, and you, you, you give much weight to those things. But Christ says, please listen closely, because I'm about to tell you truth. I'm going to tell you what God desires. He says, God desires, in verse 34, do not take an oath, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth. For it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. One of the names we have for Satan that is given in the Bible is the great deceiver. I want you to think about the great deception, the first one that we remember in the garden, right? And the great deceiver slithers up like a serpent. And he looks at Eve and deceives her with his words. Did God really say that to you? For you will surely not die. 
the lie? For you will surely not die if you eat of this tree. He's really not going to kill you if you do that. The great deceiver. And we look at this idea and we say, does our yes mean yes? Satan has worked his way into our culture through lies. Through the ability of saying lies and not even feeling guilty about it anymore. This is a lesson that probably all of us can hear. If I were to quote Christ later on, those who have ears, let them hear. Because I think all of us, honestly, if we think honestly about our life, we can look to our own life and say, are we causing deceit And maybe the words we're saying? Are we not completely honest with our words or maybe stretching or exaggerating truth? Do you find yourself in a situation where you have to add weight to your words by saying things like, I promise you can believe me this time? Honest, honest. Just trust me. Next time you hear somebody saying that or maybe in your own mind thinking you need to say that, ask yourself why. Why are you having to say that? Are you a person of integrity, of honesty? But I say to you, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. When our righteousness exceeds, our yes means yes. If my righteousness is going to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, my yes means yes I don't lie. Regardless of the situation I'm in. Regardless if I caught a fish this big. Or if I'm getting out of something and trying to lie my way out of it. I don't lie. If my righteousness is that that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees that comes from my heart. I don't lie. In Proverbs chapter 6 verses 16 through 19. If you have your Bibles open up to Proverbs chapter 6. In all of Solomon's wisdom, he gives these practical warnings in chapter 6. Chapter 6 of Proverbs is such a great practical chapter that allows us to truly understand what God desires from us. In Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 16, Solomon says this. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. I want you to recognize something. In those seven things, two of them have to do with us lying. How much weight does God place on that? How much weight does God place? On the lies we tell. The dangers of it. Abraham Lincoln said, nobody has a good enough memory to make a successful liar. I want you to think about what that means for you as a Christian. Somebody who has a responsibility to bring lost souls to Christ. To tell the truth of who Christ is. If we cannot be believed on the everyday words we say, will we believe when we speak truth about Christ? Yes or no? No. Well, I couldn't believe him, and he told me he was going to be here three times last week. Why would I believe anything else he has to say to me? Well, he told me he was going to pay this to me, and he never paid that to me. Why would I believe anything else he's going to say? He told me he every time he goes out and goes fishing, he catches fish this big. I went out with him one time, and we didn't even see a fish. Why would I believe anything else he has to say? All my life, I grew up and my dad told me this. And to come to find out, he was wrong. Why would I believe anything else he says? Do we have that reputation? Because if we have that sort of reputation, how effective can we bring in bringing people the truth of the gospel? Hypocrisy is one of the greatest things that are ruining the church today. Lies ruin the church today. 
Man, I was standing around with a group of people that I thought I could trust. And I told them, I said, please, I'm going to tell you something. I really need help on it, but this cannot leave this group of people. And before long, everybody in the church knows about it. What have I learned? I learned I can't trust anybody. That is destroying the church. It's destroying our efforts of, of evangelizing. God hates lies. He repeats it twice in Proverbs chapter 6. When our righteousness exceeds, our yes means yes. When our righteousness exceeds, we are known for our honesty. And do you not want to be that person? Do you not want to be that person that says, if I really need to go find out the truth in something, I can go to Barry Maxwell. If I really want to find the truth about somebody, I can go to Deanne Taylor. If I really want to find the truth about something, I can go to that person. Do you want to be that person that is known for your honesty? Because that's a person whose righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because those are the people, listen to me, that are going to lead people to Christ. Because those are the people that people are going to go to and say, I know I can go to them and they will give me the truth about what I've heard. This time of year, I am so confused more than any other time of year. You know why? Because I drive down the road and everybody tells me to do yes or no or vote for somebody. And I look down the road and, and every house I drive by is telling me yes on this and no on this and yes on this. I don't know what to believe anymore and I can't find a straight answer online. I don't know who to believe. But you know what I have in my life? I have a couple people that I know will always tell me the truth. And you know who I seek out when I'm confused about something? Those people. Are you that person to somebody? When our righteousness exceeds, we will be known for our honesty. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes the honesty may hurt, but we're known for our honesty. Sometimes honesty is hard to hear, but we need to be known for our honesty. Sometimes as we're studying scripture, the text we read may be difficult to hear, but we need to be known for our honesty. I could have turned the page and not preached on divorce last week. That would have been a lot easier, but divorce is truth, and that's in the Bible. And sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes the truth hurts, and it's difficult. Are we willing to be truthful to the people we're with? Are we known for our honesty, our integrity? I want people in my life that I can trust. That when they say yes, I know it means yes. And when they say no, I know it means no. And I believe it's a struggle we all have. I'll point to myself first and foremost. It's hard sometimes. It's hard to give the truth every time. Um, because of self-preservation. Because of pride. Maybe because I just don't know what else to say. When our righteousness exceeds, we are known for our honesty. Those who are known for their honesty, when they say Christ is the Son of God, the people around them say that he must be. Paul was a man known for his honesty. And when people listened to Paul, they knew. They knew. That's why it shook them so much in Acts chapter 9. After Paul went through his conversion on the road to Damascus, after he was a changed person and he went into the synagogue and began proclaiming the word of God, you remember what the people said? Wait a minute. Isn't this Saul the persecutor of Christians? And as soon as he began proclaiming truth to them, the text says they listened. They wanted to hear. Some people didn't, of course, but there were those who did. Why? Because they wanted to know why Paul was like this. Why was he telling this? 
and continued through all of his epistles, the rest of his life, proclaiming the truth of who Christ was. People wanted to listen to him. Not only will our righteousness, if our righteousness exceeds, our yes will mean yes, and we'll be known for our honesty. When our righteousness exceeds, the name of God will not be profaned. If we are swearing by something, and we are not keeping that, God's name is profaned. It's cheapened. And that's what was happening in, in this time. They were cheapening the holy things of God. Well, will you say it's not God that I swore by. It's just his temple. Well, guess what? It's his. And you say you weren't swearing by heaven or earth. Well, those are his. Even your head is his. So if I'm having to make extra oaths to add weight because I am a liar and people look at me as being dishonest, I am profaning the name of God as a Christian because that is what I wear as a title. But if my righteousness exceeds of that, then when I say yes, I become somebody who's known for my honesty and upholds and glorifies God. You know, it's no coincidence in Matthew 16, look at what he says. If you look at this idea of glorifying versus profaning, look at what he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. You see the contrast between the idea of glorifying God and profaning God in what, our, what we're saying and what we're doing? Those who have their righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees are glorifying God through their words. When my yes means yes, God is glorified. And when my no means no, God is glorifying. He is the one that's receiving the glory because I stand for him and that is who I live by. That is who I serve. He is the reason we are who we are. But when my yes doesn't mean yes, God is profaned. He is being degraded. Literally, if you look up that concept of what is profane, it's something that has taken the spiritual aspect out of it. It's becoming earthly. So by me, in my Christian walk, professing Christianity, I went to church on Sunday morning and I took the Lord's Supper and, and I'm a godly person and I lie. That's reflecting poorly on God. That's profaning God. Well, who can I look to then? If the hypocrisy of the church is running rampant, who can I truly believe? Because God is being profaned. When you look at these concepts, we must understand that like last week and the week before and the week before that and continuing on in this series. It comes from our heart. So here's the question I'd like to leave you with this morning. Why? Why is honesty so Hard. Maybe we're sitting here this morning saying, well, it's not. Well, check your heart. Is it flowing from a pure heart? Is our heart belong to God? Is, are you his this morning? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I am mine no more. For the things I say and the things I do, the promises I make are not mine, but they're his. And they flow from a heart that belongs to him. My encouragement for each of us this morning is to evaluate the words we say. And maybe each of us can work on letting our yes be yes and our no be no. Let's pray. God Almighty, we are so thankful to be your children. Father, we know things come up in this world that are difficult, and sometimes words come out of our mouth that are dishonest, deceitful. Father, please forgive us of those words. Forgive us of those times. Forgive us of those things we say. 
Father, help us to desire honesty in our life, integrity. Father, not only to help us to let us be, uh, have this integrity for you, but also for your word, for the words we say. Help us to live our life for you so people could see our words and our good works and glorify you. Father, be with us as we live in this life and this culture that says it's okay to be dishonest. Father, help us desire your word to penetrate our hearts and our minds and not the word of our culture. We're so thankful that we have this forgiveness of sin, this mercy, and this grace through your son. Father, help us to continually have hope even though we mess up every day. Forgive us of those sins and make us right. Create in us a clean heart, O God. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. There may be somebody here this morning who needs the prayers of this body. And maybe you're sitting in the pew this morning and you're thinking, I need to somehow turn my way around. Maybe it's a repentance of sins that you may need to repent of. Maybe you need an accountability partner, somebody to help you along your everyday life because you're struggling with a sin that's haunting you. Maybe it's time for you to give your life to Christ in a full commitment. Him is your king. God is your father. Repenting of those sins and being buried in the watery grave of baptism. Whatever the need might be, we can meet that need this morning. Why together we stand and while we sing the psalm that's been so long. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessings, all my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sing that sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sing that sweetest song of all. You can be seated. If we can pull it up, let's go ahead and we'll sing a couple of verses of I am mine no more, unless you're ready. Okay, we'll sing a couple of verses. So, I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. Jesus is my Lord. I am mine no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And he rules my life. Jesus is my Lord. And he will come again. He will come again. And he'll take me home. He will come again. For I am mine. I am mine. 
Cindy Willingham has come forward this morning. She's been coming to the ladies' Bible classes on Wednesday and is just wanting the strength to make changes in her life that she needs to. And it's so awesome that when somebody recognizes that there's changes that need to be made in our life, and I think probably all of us could request the same prayer, um, and you're not alone on this. Uh, I commend you for your bravery in coming forward. It's not easy, but it shows your heart and what your desire is to change. Um, I encourage you to get to know Cindy and come up and, and hug her neck and, and tell her we're praying for her. Um, but I think it's something that we look at in our own life and really ask ourselves, are we willing, is heaven worth it for us to make the appropriate changes in our life and to get the help we need, even if it means stepping out of a comfort zone um, and making those changes? So, Monty, if you would come up and, and pray for Cindy. Um, he's one of our elders here at, at Broadway. I'd appreciate it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you uh, are there for us, that you are there, that you see our struggles, that you see what we're going through, that you see our lives, uh, that you care for us, Father, that you love us. And we pray, Father, right now that uh, Cindy will be strengthened, she will be encouraged, that your hand will be with her and that you will guide her. And with all of us, Father, we, we appreciate so much her willingness to uh, lay her needs and, and desires before your throne, and we pray, Father, that you would be there for her and she for us to be an encouragement uh, to help us all get to heaven one day, Father. Uh, forgive us when we fail you, is our prayer in your son's holy name. Amen. All right. So, I, I didn't plan on covering the whole entirety of the movie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka, but I just... I joked with Paul Ludovici that I could probably preach out of that movie as many times as I've seen it in my life, you know, multitudes of times. But if you haven't seen it or if you have seen it, you can think to the end of the movie and all the kids mess up. All of them do. But there's the one little boy who comes at the end and he has that feeling of, but he's unworthy. He had messed up too. And in the moment, for as flawed as Willy Wonka is as a character, he recognizes that heart. And I just always loved that moment. So I'm very thankful for hearts that are contrite or broken before God, and we all can move that way together towards God. So I'm glad you're all here to worship with us this morning. I'm very thankful for this opportunity to sing together, to worship, to read from God's Word, and we all have an opportunity to think back on our blessings and the things that we can accomplish together when we bind together as a church community. We have another one of those opportunities here at the end of this week. We have our trunk or treat coming up which seems to match with, it was not planned to talk about, you know, a candy factory on the candy week, but there we go. Um, things work out sometimes, whether I plan it that way or not. And so we do need candy donations for that to make, make it happen. We have hundreds of people who show up. So all the way up until the event, if you could bring some candy to the building to help that take place, we would greatly appreciate it. If you have a desire to be one of the trunks at the event and you haven't signed up yet, if you could sign up just that way we know to expect you. Of course, if you want to show up and you have your plans changed at the last minute, we'll welcome you in, but it helps us plan appropriately if you'll get your name there on the sign-up sheet in the lobby. But at this time, let's have one more prayer for the things that God has blessed us with this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a God of all good things. You provide for us in ways that maybe we don't even think about, we don't recognize, but you have cared for us day in and day out. Lord, I pray that we can be thankful for those blessings and find ways to share them with others whether that's through the things that we're able to accomplish in a worship service or a Bible class or a community event or other activities that we do to outreach to others, sharing your light, spreading your name, and hopefully being those beacons of honesty and trust that the world so desperately needs. Lord, I pray that as we are thankful for our blessings, we will give back, we will find ways of service, for you will bless those efforts more than we can imagine. It's in Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. Once again, welcome to everybody here at the Broadway Church of Christ, either whether online or here in person, especially our visitors. We're so pleased to have you all with us, and 
Hope you've been uplifted by today's service. Thank you so much for Dustin and Jed and, and the good work they've done, and all the men who served in our worship experience this morning. We're so appreciative of you all and, uh, and the good things that you all are doing. A lot of good things going on here at Broadway. Um, thanks again for everybody who helped out with the Walk for Water. Uh, we had a great time, good, good turnout, uh, raised the funds that we need for our uh, overseas efforts uh, in Benin, and so we really appreciate those. And if you didn't get a chance to serve in that uh, opportunity, there's plenty more coming up. As Jed was talking about on uh, uh, later this week, on uh, the Saturday, we've got trunk, for treat, or trunk or Treat coming up, and we need help with that uh, set up. We need help with candy, things, anything that you can... Uh, you can add to that. There's a sign-up sheet up in, in the foyer there at the Connections desk. And also we have the New Pathways uh, dinner coming up on Thursday, October 24th. And we have some different volunteer needs for that. So if you'd like to help serve in that capacity on um, Wednesday at 10 a.m., there are going to be a setup crew here to assist with arranging the tables and decorations and things like that. Uh, so that will be uh, available as a sign-up in the front as well. And then actually the day of, on Thursday, October 24th, from 5 to 8, there'll be the silent auction. There needs to be some assistance with that, people to come and help uh, tidy up a little bit, ask question, answer questions, and, and assist with the checkout uh, from, from that. And then from 4.30 to 6.30, uh, kitchen help. We need uh, assistance with that as well. So a lot of things going on here at Broadway, a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, things going on in the connections groups, uh, if you're interested in those. Uh, uh, ask me or any, any of the Connection leaders about their groups and uh, how you can get involved with that. Uh, if you'll be standing, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're again so thankful that you uh, love us, that you uh, are there for us whenever we need. And we need, Father, uh, to be able to come to you humbly and to lay our requests at your feet knowing that you the good Father will answer us and will give us direction and care and love. And we pray, Father, for Cindy and all the needs that she has and all of us who are struggling right now, Father, with our lives. Uh, you know the difficulties that we have, the temptations that are before us, uh, the struggles that we have to, to do your will. And we just pray that you would encourage us uh, and, and be there for us, Father, as, as the guiding light. Um, there's so many of our number, Father, who are struggling with illness and with loss, and we pray that you would be with them, that you would encourage them, heal them, Father, and help us to be that encouragement to them as well. Help us, Father, again, to go through this world as your light uh, and to be mindful of those who are in need around us is our prayer in your Son's holy name. Amen.